From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. I'm Paul Gigo with Kim Strassel and Alicia Finley. Alicia, why don't you hit a couple of the policy highlights in the Manchin-Schumer deal to uh, not to get too deep in the weeds, but just give us a sense of what is in here, which we should care about. Perhaps the biggest thing is the corporate minimum tax. It's a 15 percent minimum tax on book income. So currently there's a 21 percent corporate tax rate on your actual income. Yeah, net uh, income. Taxable, right. Adjusted gross income. This would hit your financial statements, which can be different for some corporations. This would supposedly only hit those with more income than $1 billion. The key difference there is the expensing and investment provisions. So this provision would raise about $313 billion over 10 years, which is not insignificant. There's also some quote-unquote drug pricing reform that would allow Medicare to negotiate drug prices for a basket of drugs, would supposedly, again, start small, but would grow over the decade. There's $80 billion for the IRS to go around and harass small businesses. This is really intended as a funding mechanism, though, of course, Democrats do want to harass small businesses. But this is mainly intended as a funding mechanism to create supposed $120 billion in savings that they can say is helping reduce the deficit. There's $370 billion just for climate subsidies, and this is a mix of grants for the states to basically do whatever they want in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So whether that's investing more in EV chargers, Um, there's also a ton of tax credits in there for businesses, for hydrogen, nuclear, obviously the EVs, wind, solar, anything you can basically think of. There's a lot of corporate welfare in there as well. Well, Kim, I mean, at least point, that is putting it mildly. If you're Al Gore and you're investing in these green businesses, I mean, this is a windfall, right? I mean, you're going to, in a corporation that's looking for, especially if their book income is going to be taxed 15% guaranteed, you want to be able to say, okay, how do we reduce our tax liability? And, oh, well, let's invest in the things that Joe Manchin and Chuck Schumer say we're going to subsidize. So, I mean, this is going to be a corporate welfare land rush for green energy, for things like carbon capture that some big companies like Exxon and Chevron are investing in. And that's going to is basically a form of politicized allocation of capital. It means that the government is saying, yes, invest in these things, and we will essentially pay you to do that, versus other things like investing in oil and gas or investing in other things like your core business. So there's going to be an economic impact here, but for the donor to the Democrats, the big climate donors, they're going to be thrilled with this. Yeah, let me give you an example of just how widely that money is going to be thrown and the array of businesses that are going to be able to tap federal funds. There are production tax credits for the manufacturing of solar panels, wind turbines, batteries, critical minerals processing. There's $10 billion in here for tax credits to build clean technology manufacturing facilities, which basically is for anybody. There's $2 billion in grants to retool existing auto manufacturing facilities. Facility. So Detroit is going to cash out. There's $20 billion in loans to build clean vehicle manufacturing facilities. Again, something for Detroit. It goes on and on. And one of the things I think is important to note here is that this is strategic in that the focus for a long time among the climate activists and a lot of Democrats in particular in the Senate was they wanted to crack down on the production of fossil fuels and the use of fossil fuels by penalizing, for instance, electricity producers that continue to run coal plants, etc. That did become a red line for Joe Manchin. And so what this bill is about is the other side of it. Okay, if we can't shut down fossil fuels, we're going to, as you say, Paul, essentially bribe and lure industry with a giant pot of cash into changing to different types of electricity and cleaner manufacturing facilities by giving them tons of money and corporate welfare funded by taxpayers. It's going to result in an enormous amount of misallocation of capital and lost investment opportunities in more productive areas. But this is the political strategy 
driving this. Well, and the implications in the real world for business are significant in the sense that if you subsidize heavily these areas of wind and solar, you reduce the cost of that. And competitively in the marketplace for energy, that reduces the cost compared to fossil fuels. And that tends to, at the margin, make a business or a utility say, or a business say, well, I'm not going to invest in fossil fuel energy. So that's an indirect way of, of reducing investment in oil, gas, or coal, and which, as we've seen here in Europe, has become catastrophic because of their reliance on Russian gas. And that has implications for U.S. energy security. Alicia, I just want to point out that Manchin, I guess he's got a promise from Nancy Pelosi and Schumer that they're going to have a vote on a bill that will ease permitting rules for things like gas pipelines and other fossil fuel facilities. So that's the trade-off he claims to have gotten. Maybe he's right. I don't know. We'll see. But we haven't seen the nature of this permitting bill. Permitting is a very difficult area. It has been, along with permitting and regulation, two of the tools that the climate left have used to stop oil pipelines and other investments, and that along with lawsuits. And of course, we don't know if this bill will even pass, the permitting bill. I think that's right. We don't know what's in it, first of all. You need to streamline the permitting, but you also have to somewhat overhaul the judicial process. I mean, Manchin has made a big issue of the Mountain Valley Pipeline, which has been stuck up in courts. The Fourth Circuit uh, Court of Appeals keeps blocking it, quibbling over some issue with its environmental review that FERC has done. And so you really need to reduce the judicial discretion to block these projects. And then another example I can throw out is the judge in January who overruled or invalidated an offshore lease sale, complaining that the administration didn't consider the greenhouse gas emissions that could result from foreign countries consuming that oil. I'm a little skeptical that Democrats will agree to something, anything substantive, that will actually fix this problem or override the Biden administration's attempts to use regulations to stop these kinds of projects. I certainly share that skepticism, Alicia. The politics of this really can look bad for Senate Republicans in the sense that I think this leaves them looking naked in a barrel in the middle of Pennsylvania <laughs> Avenue. Uh, uh, and maybe it's not kind even, of you to give them the barrel. Uh, Paul. Uh, yeah, that's a close call. I think some of the staves in that barrel are missing. I mean, they basically, first of all, they said, OK, we're going to sign up for a trillion dollar infrastructure bill last year. We're going to get big permitting reforms in it, no tax increase, and we got rid of the IRS $80 billion in funding, and we'll do that, and then they won't pass BBB. Well, okay, that happened for a while. And Mitch McConnell said, well, we're not going to be able to support the semiconductor subsidy bill, which is about $280 billion, if you go ahead with BBB. Okay, so they support the semiconductor bill. It passes the Senate, and within hours... Schumer and Manchin announced their new deal, and it's got the $80 billion for the IRS. It's got a big tax increase. It's got a lot of the BBB spending in it for climate and things Republicans opposed. And it looks like the draft was so far along, the draft language, that they already submitted it to the parliamentarian to pass through reconciliation. And Nancy Pelosi issued a press release right after saying, oh, I'm there with you guys. So, no, I'm not sure Mitch McConnell deserves the barrel, Kim. <laughs> well, that story you just told is very damning to Republicans. But let me tell you why it's even just a little bit worse. This reconciliation bill, the vehicle that they are using to pass this giant tax and energy blowout, is going to expire the end of September because it goes from fiscal year to fiscal year. So all Republicans had to do was continue to hold that semiconductor bill out and say, we're not going to go along with anything and wait to make sure that a deal didn't come about before everybody left to go off and campaign for the midterms. And I know that they kind of wanted to pass that bill themselves. Why? Because that was the other thing that's just ridiculous about this, is that here's a Republican Party 
everything is going their way in terms of the election narrative. The public is unhappy about inflation. It's unhappy about the state of the economy. It doesn't feel as though the administration knows how to govern at the moment. The polls are just in the tank for Biden and for Democrats. That's all you need to go in and do well in an election. But what makes this very, just looks so bad for Republicans is in the end, the reason they decided to do this chips bill is because about a dozen Republicans really wanted to bring home that corporate welfare pork for their home states because of semiconductor manufacturing facilities there or the tantalizing thought of more. And so they joined hands with the Democrats. Mitch McConnell chose, I guess, in the end, not to hold them back and keep that leverage out. And suddenly, bang, now you have this surprise announcement. They've got nothing now to exert any leverage or any influence. They really look silly. Well, they'll end up having signed on to about $1.28 trillion of spending in a bipartisan bills, the semiconductor bill and the infrastructure bill, putting their political blessing on that. And then now they're hapless to be able to stop this reconciliation bill. So yeah, this is hugely embarrassing for them as political strategists, and they look really bad. Does this pass? You know, there are not many obstacles here. Kirsten Sinema, the Arizona senator, has not signed on to it yet. But is she going to be a lone Democrat to hold it up in the Senate? I doubt it. The, some of the Democrats in the House say they want the state and local tax deduction expanded. But if I know Nancy Pelosi, she will uh, bludgeon them. And I use that word bludgeon advisedly into coming along. And uh, I suppose the parliamentarian who could rule to keep some of these things out based on the budget reconciliation rules, which uh, sometimes limit non-germane issues that could kick out one or two things. But it looks to me like this is probably going to pass. What do you think, Alicia? Last word. Yeah, I do not see them or Republicans. They've given away their leverage and Nancy Pelosi has a record, you know, forcing the quote unquote moderates in swings districts to, you know, walk the plank. They will probably lose their seats anyways in November. So they're going to get past this before that. All right. I share that view. All right, Kim and Alicia, thanks so much for following this. Uh, Very helpful and informative. Thank you all for listening. We're back every day now on Potomac Watch, so please listen in and hope you're with us tomorrow for another edition of our podcast. Thank you.